Black Dragon, and I would love to welcome you to another edition of Black Dragon Biker News Network, Biker News. You can trust! And as always, I'd like to thank you for tuning in from wherever it is in the world that you happen to be. Good morning to all of my good people all over the world, including Sven over in Germany and uh, Motorhead and all the great folks, Motorhead over in Brazil. I just uh, appreciate all of you guys for tuning in with me daily. And uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Black Dragon, the host of Black Dragon Biker TV. In the mornings, uh, Monday through Friday, we do the Biker News Network, Biker News You Can Trust. You can get us on uh, Black Dragon Biker TV on uh, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, also on Instagram TV. Look for us. Please like, share, and subscribe our videos. Uh, we do biker news. We're the only ones now, uh, as Hollywood has now departed that arena. Uh, so there's only one biker news network television uh, YouTube thing going on right now. That's me. Uh, and uh, so please share us and recommend us. And then we also do MC Protocol and those kinds of things. All kinds of uh, MC culture videos. And uh, this one's kind of an MC culture video today. Uh, imagine somebody uh, actually collecting all of your club's like uh, memorabilia. Uh, getting things from uh, your... Uh, uh, past members, some of your greatest members, collecting their cuts, things they should have been buried in, and putting all that stuff in some kind of a museum. I've been called a culture vulture before. Someone has said in their videos uh, things like, Black Dragon is a culture vulture. Well, they never, they never said my name, but, but uh, to, to me... Um, this is what a culture vulture is. And, uh, when I, when I see a story like this, being a clubber guy, um, my blood boils. I just get, I get angry and I blame a lot of this on clubbers, MCers who don't really quite get it. They don't c quite get uh, the idea of club property. They don't get the idea of um, of um, things that belong to the club should stay with the club. These are like MC protocol 101 things. So uh, this story I found on the Los Angeles Times. Um, and um, it came out uh, yeah, this morning. Collecting memorabilia from biker gangs, he earned friends and death threats. And I can, I can imagine why. I, I got a video I'm going to show you, and it's almost uh, to me, it's almost. Um, I mean, I see something like this, and you know, these aren't even my clubs. These, these, these aren't my clubs. Um, but. My blood boils for them. So uh, uh, 
It was a name Bo Bushnell heard, had heard again and again as he sought out memorabilia from the outlaw motorcycle clubs that thrived in Southern California during the 1950s and 60s. And um, uh, since he'd started collecting, he'd bought uh, photographs and clothing, even a couple of motorcycles. But um, but the bikers he talked to often told him he tr- he should try to find out what had happened uh, to Mother Ruth's scrapbooks. She had lived in La Puente, located conveniently halfway between biker clubhouses in Venice and San Bernardino, and acted as sort of a den mother to riders who stopped at her house. She fed them, patched up their wounds, let them crash for the night, and she photographed them and collected news clippings. That's how the story kind of goes, starts out. And, um... Uh, I'm going to play this video for you. It looks like Wild One Percenter is trying to call in. And uh, I'm going to see if I can get him. We haven't had him on the show in forever. Hold on a second here. Because uh, it didn't connect through my Bluetooth initially. So I've got to figure out what's going on with that. Uh, there we go. Let's try it that way. All right. We'll try to call him back. As I show you guys, as I get ready to show you guys this video. Yo. Hey, what's up, Wild? How are you doing? How are you this morning? Good, good. Just see a little break at work, and I saw you on, so I was like, hey, let me give my call. Well, we're getting ready to go headlong into uh, this story today. Um, this story is really crazy. It's about a guy who has collected it's i call the guy a culture vulture who has collected up all of these these mc's things so uh we're going to go directly into this and and for those of you who uh want to have more of this story than um just um the video i'm going to show you as i talk about it for those of you who want to have more to this story, um, I would invite you to go to this Los Angeles Times article and uh, just look at the stuff this man has collected from uh, all of these motorcycle clubs. Well, you'll get a good idea about it after I show you this video. So we're going to uh, break into the video right now. And then Damn right. after we get done with it, we'll get some perspective um, from Wild One Percenter. So uh, here we go into this video. Try not to get too, if you're, <laughs> if you're like me, you probably get really angry. But here we go. We're going to go right into this. Oh, hold on. That didn't work. Uh, they hit me with a commercial. They always do this to me, um, which I didn't have a commercial before, so. I guess I had to pay that price. Okay, here we go. We're here. Hold on a second. This is, uh, here we go, bros. Um, check this out. I don't have any sound. What happened to my sound? There it is. And action! Allows this to come out. And that's an actual bowl that you could smoke out of. Um, tobacco, of course. My name is Bo Bushnell, and this is the RICO, aka the Research Institute for Contemporary Outlaws, aka the Outlaw Archive. This is one of the founders of the Hells Angels. This was his second cutoff vest, so it's from 1953. A small portion of the Straight Satan's archive, we have about 10 members photo albums. They lived in the Venice Canals in the 1960s notorious for being part of Manson's crew of people, but ended up testifying against him to put him in jail. Putting this collection together has not been easy. I've had multiple death threats from multiple clubs. For the last seven years, have basically lived off the grid, nothing under my name. Everything goes to a P.O. box. 
I don't fear for my life. I guess at one point maybe I did, but just to be safe, you never know. This wall is dedicated to the uh, Burdue Hells Angels. Burdue is slang for San Bernardino, goes back to the 1800s. This belonged to a guy named Gut Turk, who was a Hells Angel and then a Mary Prankster. This is the pattern for the chain stitcher for the death head from the 1960s. And then this is a stock certificate from when the Hells Angels incorporated in 1966. Probably the only one in the world. One of two, maybe. In 2012, I did a series of documentaries for the MoCA LA called The Art of Punk. They were short documentaries about the art behind Dead Kennedys, Black Flag, and Crass. I did that with a uh, guy named Brian Ray Turcott, who has the largest punk collection in the world, and he really inspired me. We came across a photo album that belonged to one of the straight Satans, and the way it's put together was like a piece of art photos, labeled, um, newspaper clippings. This is our class two bank vault, nine inches of cement all around and a 4,000 pound door. It's where the archive is stored. There's about 35,000 pieces in here. These are all basically photo albums on the sides. This side as well. This is where all the textiles go. This is 60,000 feet of 16 millimeter film from the 1960s. This is a bike I built. It's called Phantom of the Opera. It's made up of parts from different members of motorcycle clubs. And the motor is the important part, which uh, came from a Galloping Goose member that they call the judge. He was the first felon in US history to be admitted to a state bar. And he became the uh, judge of Loomis, California in the 1970s. All these clubs consider this stuff their club property. When a member leaves the club, he's to give back his patches and anything with the club insignia. Or when he dies, he's supposed to be buried with it. They claim it as theirs, even though the people that I got them from, I got them straight from the people that they belong to, former members who believe that they earned them. And I believe that too. I think it should be theirs. This is art made by a guy named Andy. And Andy became the jeweler to the Ventura Hells Angels in 1982, I believe. He was really known for his Zippos, and uh, he started making them in 1970. They're all signed, dated, and numbered on the bottom. That part goes down, allows this to come out, and that's an actual bowl that you could smoke out of. Um, tobacco, of course. Pull this part back, and it clears the bowl. This is all handmade. This is 400 hours of work. So out of the bottom, a Coke spoon, the telescopes, and on the bottom is a roach clip. But you're not going to hand a roach clip around a circle attached to a heavy Zippo. So he created a spring-loaded mechanism to detach it. This is important to me because it's a huge piece of American history that's never been documented. Amazing personal stories. It's a subculture that has spread all across the world. These guys invented this world basically out of thin air. They were completely, completely different. They were outsiders. I think it's timely because there's a lot of people that want to be outsiders right now. The Hells Angels are thought of as being this racist organization, but now they're everywhere in the world. There's hundreds of chapters, um, every ethnicity you can imagine, pretty much. But people don't realize that back in the 1950s, it was very mixed. These guys were different, they were weirdos, so who were they to judge somebody for being different? Wow, man, that, um, that was, um, uh, let me get myself back here. So, um, when I look at that, I mean, uh, I think my mouth was just, like, wide open the whole time, um, and, uh, like my 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 mouth was just like I, and i suppose it would be interesting to uh people but if you're a clubber um rooted in in traditionalism uh all you could say is what if that was my club stuff i i'd want to i i you, you do not deserve this so this is my reaction video to that you you don't deserve 
I don't give a damn how much money you spent to have the Hells Angels original certificate of incorporation in your 4,000 4, pound door. Yeah, I don't even know how he got that originally. Bank bank vault. He, well, he bought it. He he bought it, he bought it or acquired it from somebody. I mean, just, yeah, just like you. Of course, when you're looking at it, like the, just the history of everything, you're like, that's pretty cool. But then when you start thinking like, hey, wait the fucking minute here. <laughs> if there's any of them in my club stuff, I'll be like looking ways to find this guy or location himself. But um, that is pretty shocking. And he says 3,500 items or something. St- stolen in 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 in, yeah. in my opinion, stolen. Well, and the people that probably gave it to him were you know outcasts, you know groups and cowards, and that never got their gave their cuts back or somehow never got it well, taken away or well, so unless they were. And a lot of times, uh, what happens is um, families will get that stuff when you get sick or you right. die or something like that. Um, there, there. You know, we I, we have had this happen in my own motor. My own motorcycle club is fifty years old, so we have looked on the internet and seen full patches uh, for sale, and um, we we we, uh, we 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 we've looked at there and and I mean it it causes such a a fervor, and we get that stuff. We find that stuff, we buy that stuff back, we get it, because it belongs to the club. That is, you know, and he said, you know, and he knows that. Somebody said he has a death wish, uh, or a thanatos, as it's called. Um, And you would have to live off the grid, I would think. Um, So I don't, the guy looked like he had a hell of a lot of money, to be able to yeah. store that stuff the way he stores it. So I don't know how he makes He's his money. Probably, probably a trust fund baby or something. Oh, I don't know. I don't know how he makes his money or whatever he does. Uh, somebody said there should be an MC museum where families can donate that stuff too. So, Kat, uh, what families need to do is give the stuff back to the club. And what clubbers need to do is educate their families or put in their wills or whatever, that the minute I stop breathing, uh, my stuff doesn't go to my grandson. Uh, my stuff doesn't go... Uh, the, the founder of the Black Sabbath MC Nation gave me this. This didn't go to his son. This didn't go to his, his nephews. This didn't go to his relatives. This went to a president or at the time a national president in his motorcycle club this this won't this won't go to my son <laughs> this won't go to my daughter this won't go to my my grandkids this this will go to a full patch member of the mighty black sabbath motorcycle club nation s- somewhere at some time uh, or it'll go in my grave with me uh, as will uh, my cut and those sorts of things. They're, they'll go back to the club or they'll go in the grave uh, or they'll go in the fire. That That's what families should do. That's the proper protocol that, that, that doesn't get to, to, it's not, it's not like a, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, motocross museum or a or a uh, t- who won the latest formula one motorcycle clubs uh, laguna's uh, laguna <laughs> run or something to me um i am i just my mouth is wide open i can't believe it uh, i guess i can believe it and the thing about it is this man knows. Clubs have told him. Cat uh, said this guy must be loaded to be able to afford all that MC stuff. I'm sure he pre- he for some of the stuff. I'm sure he paid good prices. I I know a guy. I I know a guy that did this with my own motorcycle clubs stuff. 
collected and collected and and um uh and he he uh is in our club and um you know my my thing is um even a club member collecting that stuff up uh if not sanctioned by the club shouldn't be done um mm-hmm. a lot of times what'll happen is uh this stuff is sitting in family garages and attics and archives and you've got old people that are maybe a guy died and was left with his mother and you go and you go get in that person's good graces and you you tell them stories about the club and and they'll just give the stuff to you they'll give it to you they'll just hand it over to you not knowing um uh Sven says as an as an MC I try my best to get uh MC stuff and gear back to the MC uh absolutely um uh, i i just i'm just um blown away so as a as a show there's not mu- there's not much to say, <laughs> to say. <laughs> I, I look at that and just shaking my head the whole time yeah. a, a, as a show uh that that uh uh um that talks about uh these kinds of things uh he, uh, um, I, I just, you know, I have to tell you, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. That's not the way clubs see it. Uh, somebody said, did he buy it at an, at an auction, an FBI auction or an ATF auction? And that's another place he could have got that stuff. Um, he could have gone to, you know, they get rid of evidence and stuff after a while. Uh, somebody said the dude is a simp. He doesn't even ride. And, uh, he might ride. I mean, he built a motorcycle, so <laughs> I'm sure maybe he rode it to build it. But to have like this is Galloping Pete and 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 uh, Killer Bill, and you know, to have people uh, 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 to have people who are probably icons in in these clubs to have their stuff. Um, it's just. Um, crazy man crazy so as i as i look at the the story um let me see if i can get back to the story um in this story he talks about um uh some of the stuff like the 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 mother the the lady he was talking about in the beginning of the story uh died and um um he you know, he began to uh, uh, look for stuff. Back in 2013, he hadn't even been interested in motorcycles. He wasn't uh, looking to collect photos of outlaw biker gangs, and he certainly wasn't looking for trouble. But uh, when he got into working for it, you know, he's like a lot of people. Uh, he, 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 he got a fascination and, you know, went crazy with it. Um, so uh, he he purchased uh, some photos. That, you know, I'm just glancing over the article. He purchased some photos for like twenty five hundred dollars and resold them a short time later for forty five thousand uh, dollars. So that's crazy. Um, so I guess there's some money to be made in this. <laughs> and I because like what would uh what would the Hell's Angels give you for the only stock certificate left in the world from when they incorporated. I mean, what would they give you for that? I, I guess you could probably get a lot of money for that. Uh, so uh, it looks like he's uh, paid $7,500 to acquire uh, a collection of uh, pictures, uh, which had belonged to two Venice members of the Straight Satans. So he's paid some good damn money for this stuff. So, you know, the root of all evil is money. Uh, so as I'm looking through this article, uh, you know, he's actually paid and sold and resold. Uh, when you buy some pictures for $2,500 and sell them for $45,000, uh, this is good money. Uh, so it says in the article, after acquiring the first cash, he was hooked. He began, he began tracking down former members of various clubs. So you go, former members of various clubs. And like I told you, befriending them and asking them to tell their stories and offering to buy 
their their memorabilia from past years. So uh, I've seen this happen where you will go and make friends with these folks or their relatives or their wives or girlfriends, and they've got a belt buckle or a cut. And I was really kind of impressed that he actually called uh, that jacket, that vest, he called it the right thing. Here's his cutoff vest. Very few people know that kind of terminology. So um, uh, I thought that was interesting. Did we lose you, Wild? Are you still there? No, I'm just, I'm just here <laughs> listening to you talk. So uh, he, he said he became obsessed and hyper-focused. Uh, uh, one glimmer of light, like a glimmer of light, and he's down the rabbit hole. Uh, oh, that, that rabbit hole will take a lot of people. Even the guys that wear the fake cuffs, they buy one little thing off Wish.com. Next thing you know, they're riding around with a little pass, and they, and they keep collecting shit. Next thing you know, they're all dressed to the T. Um, it's the same thing. Y- yeah, I, I imagine so. <laughs> it's, uh, and, and yeah, and you see them get off their motorcycle, and they look real. Except their patches are not. They, 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 a lot of them study every little thing and use the right words and talk. And but then when you'll start picking them apart once you meet them. But still. So it says he was worried uh, because he knew that the quote unquote biker gangs he was dealing with didn't shy away from violence. Uh, and he remembers telling his friend, "I don't know how you do this without pissing people off." Uh, that's that's what his friend told him, but. Bushnell was unmoved. Uh, it was the bikers and their stories that Bushnell loved, and he spent enormous energy tracking them down. And just by looking at his collection, he obviously spent enormous energy, and he was obviously um, down the rabbit hole. Uh, he met a man named Droopy who was dying of cancer. And and here's another, this is another thing that clubs do. Uh, we forget are lost and fallen and dying. Like you, you've given your whole life to a club and you're laying up dying of uh, cancer and you're old and the new guys probably didn't even know you existed and the old guys uh, don't talk about you. You can, you know, and then here comes this guy that wants to know everything about you and listens to you for hours on end while you're dying from cancer. Uh, you, you give him the things that, the club maybe should have collected. You know, this uh, I blame a lot of this on the clubs. So he met a guy named Droopy who was dying of cancer, but agreed to talk to Bushnell about the old days. Eventually, bringing out pictures from his time as a straight Satan, as a, a straight Satan. And so you're dying of cancer, and you ain't got no real money for medicine and stuff like that, and you're sick. And this guy rolls out of his pocket with seventy five hundred dollars. I'm not saying that that's what happened, but, uh, you know, that could happen just like that. So it says here, later he agreed to sell Bushnell his patches, which bear the club insignia and logos. Fledgling members must earn their patches, and they are never to be given away or sold under threat of serious reprisal from the club. But if the club hadn't heard from you, haven't heard from the club in 19 years, and you're laying there dying of cancer, what the hell do you care? In early 2014, when word got out that he had the patches, Bushnell says, he got a call from a man who identified himself only as Doug and told him he was messing with the wrong people and he was going to get hurt. And I can imagine that call did come, and I can imagine it was thoroughly frightening, and it was very damn serious. Doug told him he was messing with the wrong people, he was going to get hurt, and Bushnell figured out, Doug was a hell's angel who went by Dougie Poo, so he called the biker back and convinced him to meet. Through Dougie Poo, he began to meet other riders as well, including Buzzard, Raunchy Pat, The Judge, and Bill the Shark. Though he found some of the stories they told him appalling, Bushnell related uh, to the bikers as human beings, recognizing them as fellow outsiders. So I guess he calls himself an outsider as well. The men told him about early days of motorcycle gangs. Back then, he says, it wasn't about being a steroided-out monster looking for a fight. They saw themselves as a bunch of 20-somethings who wanted to ride, get loaded, and live like 12-year-olds forever. Which uh, is 
I think that describes us pretty well. Over time, Bushnell began to record the stories they told him on audio and videotape. And, you know, you can only imagine uh, what what folks may have told him. So, you know, he might have audio tape of all kinds of things clubs wouldn't know, want people to know that they were involved in. Buzzer told him about the night he got Dougie Poo and a woman he was with high on booze and pills. When they passed out, he handcuffed them together in a compromising position. They called Dougie Poo's girlfriend and asked her to come take him home. Uh, this was revenge, Buzzer explained, for the night Dougie Poo had urinated on his leg at the bar. So these guys had a lot of fun, and uh, they told him about a lot of their experiences. Uh, and then he does what uh, great uh, entrepreneurs do in this culture in America called uh, capitalism. He uh, he made money on it. So um, to me, uh, this is a real life culture vulture. And as I'm uh, looking through this story, I mean, the pictures that this man has uh, and the the things he has, these would be priceless to the motorcycle clubs. Oh, guaranteed. This, the, the, the clubs would love to put this in their own vaults, uh, having lost significant pieces of their heritage. So this made the Los Angeles Times story, and um, it um, sparked my interest this morning. Um, Boogeyman says, as a club, the president needs to get a lawyer to get that stuff back. And uh, um, I think you would have to know um, what he might have, which I, I, I think in this article people would be probably blown away to know that he had this much or this kind of stuff. I don't know how you get to see his collection uh, if he's uh, hidden yeah, out. It must, it must be by must be by appointment only and get someone paying some, but I have no idea. Um, you, better, you better verify. <laughs> somebody said when a member dies, it's always respectful to put their cut on the wall with others that have fallen, you know, at the main clubhouse. So, but here's a problem. Clubhouses uh, like our mother chapter lost the clubhouse and all the, at the time, I think the clubhouse was, um, 43 years old and all that memorabilia, all that stuff, uh, boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff starts to go to people's homes, um, and their, uh, attics. And when they get sick and they pass away, or whatever the case may be, um, the stuff is blows to the to the seven winds. So um, the uh, um, this this story here, I mean, it just really, really angers me. Lisa Lay says, "I believe the legacy of a club member should be protected, not in a stranger's collection." Um, and so this is why I can see. Uh, clubs being angry with him, and I, I think he took a big chance with this kind of exposure uh, in um, in something like the Times. Uh, hell hey, well, someone's gonna, have, yeah, because someone's gonna know something about him where he's at, and I mean, this guy loves the limelight, so he probably told somebody or showed somebody where he's at. Anyways, well, um, and you know, he that place is somewhere, and um, uh, you know. But he might not need to show it to anybody at all. Maybe he just collects and sells the stuff because there would be if you if you're a club with a lot of money. And then you know you said something about going to court. Uh, it takes big money to go to court, and some of the clubs don't have big money uh, to to go to court. I mean, heck, the Mongols spent a million dollars fighting the government. If my club had to spend a million dollars, we'd have been out of the game. <laughs> that, that's just we we'd have been done. Like. Uh, uh, yeah, Mr. Attorney, sure, I need a million. Uh, ha, we wouldn't have it. So it takes, um, it takes a lot. Um, as an old one percenter from the 70s, and I still know some old Goose members, this made me a little sick and angry, says Viking Rider. Bro, I, it, it made me sick and angry, too. That's why I dedicated the whole show to this. Um, 
So uh, I'm a club prospect, first time. Good info makes sense. Uh, yeah, so uh, good to have you, uh, prospect. Um, and, uh, yeah, learn these lessons, bro. Uh, well, aside from the obvi obvious, it's also dangerous. Um, somebody says 45 ACP. <laughs> That's a brother named Goose from my club. And, uh, yeah, Goose, <laughs> uh, uh, Motorhead Motor Club over in Brazil says a lot of money or a bullet between the eyes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it looks like the folks are just as pissed off as I am and you are about it. Um, that's why former members don't get to keep anything with club references, so they don't do this kind of thing. Uh, well, that's how it's supposed to be, but clubs can be. Clubs can be uh, vigilant about getting their stuff back, and then they can have periods where they're not as vigilant. And a lot of these guys from the 60s and stuff have fallen out, and and uh, nobody really um, uh, 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 cares. Um, uh, any, some of those guys don't care anymore. Uh, somebody here, uh, Chucky, said an ex-member refused to return club property and now goes around telling others how he threw our property in a fire. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, and most of the time when they say that, they haven't done that. If I haven't seen a picture, if I don't see a video of you doing that, I don't believe you did. Uh, just a heads yeah. up, if you leave a club or you're kicked out of the club, all insignia and material goes back to the club, including tattoos, says uh, uh, Bill McCaslin. And uh, yeah, you're supposed to you're supposed to cover over those cat tattoos immediately, or um, or something to to that effect. And if you're if you're not doing that, um, uh, you, and and I and because you promise that you're gonna do that when you start in the club, but the club pissed you off. They made you mad. They threw you out nasty. They. Somebody screwed your old lady. Uh, they weren't fair to you. Nobody liked you. Whatever the, the, the bailiwick is, whatever they didn't do right, now you feel this revenge thing. But I say keep your word. Remember the the way that you came into the club and the abounding pride and love you had for the club. It, people get mad, but clubs let you down because they're human, made of human beings. So, but to do this to a club, I mean, it just tears at the, it tears at the fiber and the fabric of uh, what you joined and and the word you gave, uh, when something that you owned ends up in uh, this dude's uh, very um, lucrative collection. Uh, here in Brazil, a young man almost died for trying to sell a full patch club vest on the internet. What saved him was the former member of the MC admitting that uh, he threw his vest away. Uh, so he threw his vest away and somebody tried to sell it and uh, he almost got killed for it. The boy found it on the trash and tried to make some money out of it. Being a uh, BS motor cl a motorcycle club, the former member never paid for his actions. Uh, and depending on the club, you could pay for your actions. Uh, Bushnell's collections uh, maybe contains evidence against some MCs. Who knows what some of the guys told him, uh, says Finn. Yeah. So uh, uh, lawyers have to follow laws. It's really a property law issue. The question is who owns the stuff? What about members' motorcycles? Who owns that? It just depends on the club. If you, if you're a cl if you join the club that says, okay, your motorcycles and stuff belong to, to us, and you agree to that, then you have, you've, you've made a contract. Your stuff belongs to them. Uh, somebody said, um, Lissa said, maybe he went public because there's an under-the-table deal to return everything, and in a few months the idiot will have a fire with an insurance claim. <laughs> uh, maybe. Instead of clubs getting mad, why not come together and appoint... Uh, this man as an official historian for the clubs and make an, an, an official museum and charge admittance to, admittance to help members who are in hospitals terminally ill. You know, that, hell, that might be a good idea, but that man is... That would have been, be, be been better at the beginning. 
<laughs> well, that man's making money off of that stuff. So he already passed that part. Yeah, he's 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 getting paid. I would assume. I this is what I'm assuming. So um, you know, you you can't get past that. So um, and clubs are private uh organizations. They're secret organizations, and so they don't want their stuff for sale. They don't want you to see the inside of them. They don't. They don't want you to have their pictures of uh, pissing on people's legs and tying uh, naked women to a passed out club brother so, and so you could show his wife. They don't want that out there. That's not your business. Anyway, uh, I uh, just wanted to um, uh, uh, put that out there um, today and just really show my disgust and disdain for... Uh, uh, something that that guy did. It's capitalistic. It's what we do in America. But um, if you're a clubber, you just you you feel violated. You feel like you were hit by a culture vulture. <sighs> yeah, buddy. Well, uh, wow. What do you got going on? You still doing your show? Yeah, I've been doing uh, videos once a week. I'm gonna. Start posting them on a Sunday though. This Sunday I'm going to be posting a new video. It's going to be an interesting one for for sure. And also uh, tell people how to enter a giveaway for my 5,500 subscribers giveaway, and I'll do a live next Thursday giving uh, items away and stuff. So 5,500 subscribers. I'll be damn man. I, I'm a little by little, you know. Just yeah. Little by little. Yeah, you I haven't even been doing this a year that. yet. No, I think it's just out a year at the end of the month. So it took me one year to get 3,000 subscribers. <laughs> so you're at 5,500, yeah, dude. You're flying. Yeah, man, I'm flying. Flying and riding. Yeah, I'm just a little busy, too, doing the you know club stuff and all that crap, too. So I just got to time management. That's all it is. Tell people how to get to you, Wild. Well, you can find me on Wild on Twos on YouTube and Instagram. And uh, just hit me up. Send me a message if you guys want to say hi. I'm always very uh, talkative to people. So, you know, Hollywood jo dropped Hollywood. out of the news game, right? I heard. I heard you say that. No, I didn't know any of that. I've been out of the loop, man. I haven't been on YouTube watching anything lately. Yeah, well, listen, man, I appreciate you. You know, for those of you who don't know, Wild helped me get this morning show started. I could not have done it without him here with me every morning. I just. I was in the alarm clock. <laughs> I just couldn't have done I it. See that. Yeah. I can see you changed the times more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to get something more realistic, man. Uh, yeah, that's more realistic for you. Yeah, because, you know, nobody on the West Coast could watch me at all. They were all asleep. Uh, but, uh, you know, I had to work in the daytime, so it was before I retired. I had to do all that. Anyway, my man, uh, I appreciate having you. Love you to death. Thank you for yeah, love you too, man. turning in. I'll call you a little bit later so we can talk. We haven't talked in a while. Yeah, I tried calling the other day, but, you know, I know things happen. <laughs> I appreciate you, Wild on 2, Wild 1 Percenter, Wild on 2, Motor Vlog. You guys got to get over there and check it out. Hey, listen, I'm Black Dragon. That's my two cents. Love to hear your two cents in the comment section below. We're on Monday through Friday, and on Sunday we have Bible study out of one of the very many motorcycle club Bibles I have written. So we have Bible study Sundays. Hey, that's 8 p.m. Sundays Eastern. I'm Black Dragon. Thanks for tuning in, and get skinny. Peace!